Welcome to the weekend worship service of the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for saying yes to community, yes to love and belonging. Week after week, our church reaffirms its commitment to free religious thought, social justice, and community care, lifting each other up through what we do together. If you're visiting with us for the first time, I'm delighted that you're here. Thank you for checking us out. I invite you to visit our website, slcuu.org, or our social media channels to learn more about our church community and Unitarian Universalism. Just a couple of very quick announcements as we get started today. First, Easter is just two weeks away, if you can believe that. And we want you to know that we will be offering a live worship service 10 o'clock on Easter Sunday on the same link as our regular Zoom coffee hour. Now you can find that link in our weekly Torch email, on our website, or on our Facebook page. We want to see all of you at 10 o'clock on Easter morning. Second, Registration is now open for General Assembly. It's the largest annual gathering of Unitarian Universalists. This year's GA will be virtual, and the registration fee is only $200, so it's easier than ever to attend. You can be part of amazing worship services, attend workshops to deepen your practices and skills, meet other UUs from around the world, and have fun. If you want to join in, go to uua.org slash ga slash registration. And if you're interested in serving as a delegate from our congregation, please send me an email and I can talk you through that process. Today's worship theme is generosity. All the different kinds of ways that generosity may show up in our church community. The offering that we take, the pledge that we make, is an opportunity to recommit to this place and to this people. Our offering is an affirmation, a yes. When we give, we say yes to something that we value. With our gifts freely given, may we say yes to the values of our faith. May our offering help us practice Unitarian Universalism within and beyond our congregation. The words of the Reverend Erica Hewitt to guide us as we begin our worship this weekend. Let us light the chalice in a spirit of generosity, in a spirit of yes. For Unitarian Universalists, part of our idea of generosity is built upon our interdependent web. In a sermon in 1898, First Church's first female minister, Mila Tupper Maynard, said this, We can join hands and help to make good things better and the worst good insofar as we are able. We can cooperate to bear one another's burdens and the burdens of all weak ones of the earth. We can, by this, 
gain and inspiration in our struggle to be earnest, sincere, pure, and unselfish. The book I'm sharing today speaks of this. This beautiful book also just won the Caldecott Medal for 2021. It is We Are Water Protectors. We Are Water Protectors, written by Carol Lindstrom, illustrated by Michaela Goad. Water is the first medicine, Nucomis told me. We come from water. It nourished us inside our mother's body, as it nourishes us here on Mother Earth. Water is sacred, she said. We stand with our songs and our drums. We are still here. The river's rhythm runs through my veins, runs through my people's veins. My people talk of a black snake that will destroy the land. Spoil the water, poison plants and animals, wreck everything in its path. When my people first spoke of the black snake, they foretold that it wouldn't come for many, many years. Now the black snake is here. Its venom burns the land, courses through the water, making it unfit to drink. Take courage. I must keep the black snake away from my village's water. I must rally my people together to stand for the water, to stand for the land, to stand as one against the black snake. We stand with our songs and our drums. We are still here. It will not be easy. We fight for those who cannot fight for themselves the winged ones, the crawling ones, the four-legged, the two-legged, the plants, trees, rivers, lakes, the earth. We are all related. Tears like waterfalls stream down, tracks down my face, tracks down my people's faces. Water has its own spirit, New Comis told me. Water is alive. Water remembers our ancestors who came before us, she said. We stand with our songs and our drums. We are still here. We are stewards of the earth. Our spirits have not been broken. We are water protectors. We stand. The black snake is in for the fight of its life. I'd also like a quick chance to welcome everybody to our worship service this morning. Reverend Monica has has chosen a a very uh, expansive and exciting topic uh, on generosity today. And she asked me to offer a reflection on that subject. And I thought, you know, the funny thing is, it's usually around Christmas time when we hear so many great stories about generosity. Some are wrapped in supernatural wonder when an extraordinary gift is offered and miracles just abound. Suddenly, church bells that have been dormant for generations begin to chime, or a statue presents a miraculous smile. But some stories take place in real life, and they usually point to some unexpected personal gift that displays a kind of generosity beyond the norm. I remember the story of a New York City cop who bought a pair of shoes for a homeless man sitting barefoot in front of the store. Now, all stories of generosity, 
whether they be actual or need you to suspend belief just a little, all stories, all examples of generosity have in common the offering of an unexpected gift. Generosity reflects our best selves. And surely, we want that experience. We need that experience beyond just the holiday season. Generosity is a state of mind. We live in a time, or perhaps this has always been the case, living in a time and culture where we are urged to maximize our self-interests. We're taught from early age, that's how we win this game of life. You need to look out for number one. Generosity challenges us in a, a profoundly spiritual way because we must somehow change the gears in our minds to become more attentive and caring of others. Aristotle once asked the question, what will make my life worth living? I trust that all of us, in fact, have asked ourselves that question at some point. What, what makes our life worth living? It's a vital question because well, we have so many choices in life. Generosity is a choice we deliberately make. Now, of course, we can choose not to, but doesn't generosity really give us a sense of peace? For in practicing generosity, which extends from offering kindness understanding, a smile, to large sums of money, to, to an institution that will help the lives of others. These are all intentional acts. These are the decisions we have made when there's so many other choices about how we can live our lives. When we're able to say, I've done the best I can, well, there's a, there's a certain lightness of being that follows. It's like, I'll, I'll give away some of my precious possessions, and as a result, well, there will be a change for the better. Practicing generosity means living closer to whom we want to be in this harsh and unfriendly world. Generosity helps us get in touch with our soul. It clarifies for us what we truly value. And if we want our values to live on, if we want our values to reflect who we really are, deep down to the very marrow of our being, then, then we can feel inspired to be generous. Any discussion on generosity forces us to look at ourselves in the mirror. Am I a generous person? Hmm. Well, I'd like to be, but, but there are so many other demands on my life. Okay, okay, if I want to be generous, I can be generous. Ultimately, it's, it's my choice. It's my decision about who I want to be, my decision about how I want to live my life. Generously, I think that is what we strive for. So be it.
If you've been in any church meetings lately, then you're probably aware that we're in the middle of our annual pledge campaign. And so there's a lot of talk about the generosity of the congregation. And that's good because you all are a generous bunch of people. Seriously, I'm astonished by the generosity that I'm seeing as the pledges roll in. You listen to our spiel and you're responding with deep love and trust. And I'm so grateful. The staff and leaders of our church are so grateful. It means so much to us. But this isn't the only reason I've been thinking about generosity lately. You might be forgiven for thinking it's a little harder than usual to be generous these days. So much is up in the air right now due to this dragging pandemic and the slow motion crash of our economy. The most recent federal stimulus funding is now flowing out to the American public and it couldn't come fast enough. For despite the slowing of unemployment in recent weeks, millions of jobs are now gone from our economy that are never coming back. People are hurting and they're still scared. Not to mention, we're all still worried about the virus itself. And so we might be reluctant to engage in the kinds of everyday generosity that we might have thought nothing of before last year. Stopping by a friend's house to say hi, picking up the tab at lunch, picking up the grandkids for a weekend excursion so the grown-ups can take a break. I can hardly wait to have friends over for dinner or buy someone a cup of coffee. All these have been put on hold and thousands of other little kindnesses that once greased the gears of human relationships. It's all got me thinking about generosity and what it means to be a generous person of faith. There's a paradox apparent in the question of generosity. Why is it that giving feels so good? Why don't we have a sense of loss when we give away what we have? What makes some people more generous than others? And what really makes a person or community generous? That culture of generosity that we often hear about, how do we make that a real thing? In 2018, Indonesia was recognized as the most generous country in the world by the British organization Charities Aid Foundation. Indonesians scored highest on three benchmarks. Their participation in volunteer activities was 53% of the population, the highest in the world. 46% of Indonesians helped a stranger within the measured month, and a whopping 78% of Indonesians donated money to charity, a measure for which they are consistently among the highest in the world. So what gives Indonesia such a culture of generosity? Indonesia is not considered a poor country. Only about 9% of its citizens live below its poverty line. However, that's still over 26 million people, with Indonesia having the sixth greatest income equality gap in the world. Indonesians are also among those people most likely to face short-term devastation from climate change. Coal supplies more than half its total energy making Indonesia the fifth largest producer of greenhouse gases. Deforestation, especially for the lucrative palm oil industry, results in the loss of 137 hectares of rainforest every year. Additionally, the capital, Jakarta, is well below sea level and is sinking at a rate of nine centimeters per year making it one of the most vulnerable cities in the world to the effects of climate change. It's astonishing that Indonesians could be at risk of losing so much and still be so generous. But the staggering generosity 
of everyday Indonesian people is providing solutions to the climate crisis and more, they are applying the values of their many diverse faith practices, including generosity, to the problems they face together as a nation. Muslims, for example, in the religious majority in Indonesia, are reclaiming deforested land with permaculture practices that nourish the soil and feed their villages with local foods. An indigenous community on Borneo protects their ancestral forests, creating a hedge against deforestation and prepares an annual harvest festival with ample food to serve the uninvited guests they're sure will attend. The women of an evangelical Christian community conduct scientific surveys of the sea life nearby, enforce fishing quotas, and enact bans on overfished waters, blessing both bans and catches with prayer and worship. Hindus on Bali take advantage of an annual purification festival to purify the land as well as their spirits. This day-long purification ceremony called Niepi saves 30,000 tons of carbon from the atmosphere, reducing the island's daily emissions by a third. The local priest says, when we do our rituals, we are not only doing it for Bali, it's for Buana Alit and Buana Agung. Buana Alit is the people, the microcosmos. Buana Agung is nature, the universe. And in a village on Nusa Tenggara, where most residents are disconnected from the national power grid, a Catholic priest preaches to his church about God's desire that human beings take responsibility for the care of their planet. He inspires the parishioners to build a micro hydroelectric plant on a nearby river, eliminating the need for gasoline generators to provide light and cooking heat for the village. When the power plant is destroyed by once in a lifetime floods, that are expected by many to become a semi-annual occurrence, the villagers must figure out how and whether to rebuild. Reconstruction of the pump house and dynamo, the brick supporting walls restraining the river, and new power poles will cost the village $25,000. One villager says, we know what it's like to live in the dark, we can't go back that way. But where will the money come from? The priest suggests that it's easy enough to divide the cost by the number of villagers served and charge each family an equal amount of money. But a woman asks, what about the families who don't have the money? Will they go back to generators? Clouds of noxious fumes and loud rumbling, polluting the village all night. Then a village elder speaks up, from us, by us, and for us, he says. Those who can afford to contribute money will, and those who can contribute labor will give that. Many villagers provide both, so they're fighting together. It's important to this community, not only to improve their daily lives with cheap electricity, but to do so through renewable development as a measure of devotion to their faith. The community is not waiting for other people to change their lives, said the priest. They're changing their own lives. It's not about having electricity. It's about taking care of the earth. It's our choice to protect nature. The villagers on Nusa Tengara are not motivated by saving money. They are motivated by improving their community and by protecting the earth as living embodiments of the tenets of their faith. And indeed, research corroborates that these Indonesians are demonstrating a key indicator of what makes humans generous. 
Researchers Christian Smith and Hillary Davidson conducted a 2010 study of 2,000 Americans examining the question, what sets less generous people apart from more generous ones? The participants answered a wide-ranging questionnaire about their own giving habits, but also about their lifestyles, health, beliefs, and happiness. And some submitted to an in-depth one-on-one interview in which the subject was followed throughout their daily life and asked more detailed questions about their attitudes toward giving. The results of the study were clear. People who are more generous in giving have better health outcomes, better happiness, less loneliness and depression, and more interested in personal growth than less generous persons with similar life circumstances. The question is, why? Smith and Davidson identified nine interrelated causal mechanisms by which generosity increases well-being. One of those mechanisms really stands out, especially when thinking about the generosity of people of faith in Indonesia, as well as perhaps those here at home. The researchers state that generosity increases personal agency and self-efficacy, which tends to enhance happiness and health. What does this mean? Put simply, it means that generous people feel that they have more control over their circumstances than ungenerous people, that what they do makes a difference in the world. In addition, Generous people have more of a sense of purpose in life. The ungenerous people in the survey either weren't sure what their purpose in life was or believed that each person is responsible for themselves alone. They felt no obligation to help others and felt no assurance that anyone would help them if they needed it. In contrast, each of the generous people in the survey had a sense that life has meaning and purpose and that life's meaning includes some sense of interdependence, some sense that our purpose in life is to help one another. Now, when we think of generosity, it's often financial generosity that springs to mind, but these researchers took a broad view of generosity, naming two other kinds of generosity that are just as meaningful as financial generosity. And in fact, the kinds are related. Neighborly generosity describes the actions of people taking care of each other, shoveling each other's driveways, watching each other's kids, providing a meal for someone who's sick or struggling. And relational generosity describes the ways that we might be generous with ourselves, being fully present when listening to others, making time for that kind of presence, expressing gratitude for others, expecting nothing in return for our giving, giving people the benefit of the doubt, or maybe taking a deep breath before hitting send on that email or responding to that comment on social media. These are all important ways that we can be generous to others in our relationships. And they are closely correlated to generosity and financial giving because they are related to our sense of being interconnected. It's the reason why when generous people give, they don't feel like they're losing. Truly, it feels like a win all the way around. But the Indonesians have another way of experiencing and expressing generosity. They are generous to the earth. They recognize that they are part of a vast interconnected system that includes not only human beings, but all living things. And that the things that they do in daily life, such as fishing, cutting down trees, and lighting their homes, have an impact on the world around them. They are not waiting for other countries or even their own government to take action on climate change They are giving of themselves to make a difference now. And that's how I see generosity around us and and in our church. Our giving is aligned with our principles. 
In our chalice lighting words, Reverend Hewitt said that when we give, we say yes to something that we value. I invite you to take a moment to think about how all the different kinds of gifts that we give to our church become expressions of the values that we want to see expanded in the world. Through relational generosity, we encourage one another to spiritual growth. Maybe it looks like a moment of deep listening during a small group ministry gathering, or taking time to light a chalice at the beginning of a class or meeting. Through neighborly generosity, we express the compassion of our second principle when we send a get well card or take a meal to a friend through the caring network. And through our financial generosity, we continue to provide space and support for the free and responsible search for truth and meaning, the breakdown of systemic racism, and the justice and equity that we wish to see everywhere in our society, the cultivation of beloved community right here where we are. No matter how much money we have or don't have in the bank, each one of us can afford to be generous because Unitarian Universalists are a people of faith who believe that what we do in this world matters. Our actions matter. Our words and beliefs matter. And how we show up makes a difference. And you're right. You do matter. You do make a difference every day. Thank you for being love. Thank you for being hope. Thank you for being generous. My friends, thank you so much for joining us again for worship this weekend. Now, I've saved the praise report for last today because I wanted to end on a high note. At our last count, we had five new pledges for this pledge season. Thank you so much. And 47 of you have pledged to increase your financial contribution to our church next year with 31 families increasing 20% or more. What a wonderful report to share with you. We are so grateful to each family for your pledge. It matters. It makes a difference. If you haven't turned in your pledge card yet, you can still do that, either by mail or by using our online donate button on our website or the Givelify app. Your choice, but we do ask that you send those pledges in by April 1st. Let us extinguish the chalice today with the words of Audrey Hepburn. For beautiful eyes, look for the good in others. For beautiful lips, speak only words of kindness. And for poise, walk in the knowledge that you are never alone.